So the question seems to be cropping up again. And it goes something like this. What is there left prophetically that has to happen before the rapture? What must happen before the rapture? So since that's the question of the day that seems to be doing its cycle again, it's it's motion among the thinkers, let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Jimmy. This is Last Day's Awakening. I'm glad that you are along for this little ride as we study the scripture. If you haven't subscribed, please take the time to do so and stay apprised. And if you would give this a thumbs up, it seems like that's more important than ever to get a like. And I wish it weren't so, I wouldn't ask, but if we want to get the message out, the question out, some biblical answers out into the open, then we kind of have to hit that like button. I don't know why they do algorithm rhythms the way they do, but they obviously do. So that would be very helpful. The question is, and it kind of tags along with a couple of other questions. One of those questions is, are we in the tribulation? Because we seem to see the, the characteristics of the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. And I want to hesitate using the term the tribulation just because of the lack of the definition in terms for most people. The time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, the last Shemitah. So there's several ways that we can say that. Have we entered into that time? That was the confusion amongst the Thessalonians when Paul had taught them while he was with them about the latter days, what would happen. They didn't know when they would take place, but he had, he had clearly taught them eschatology. And yet, after having been with them, he had to very soon after write letters to them to counter some forgeries that had come that made them think that they were in Daniel's 70th week, the last days, the tribulation period, and that the day of the Lord was upon them. And we're going to deal with that in just a little bit. But the question is this before us, not the tribulation, but what has to happen? What is there left that has to happen? What prophetically must happen before the rapture can take place? And so I have a list of things that must happen before the rapture can take place. So are you ready for the list? Let me get it out here. Nothing. That's right. Nothing. Now, there was a time that we could have looked and said, if we, if we were looking, and, and a lot of people were not. A lot of people had misunderstood the scripture and still misunderstand the scripture today, thinking that the church has replaced Israel. And so Israel is, since it's not a nation, Israel is no longer in the place of the covenant. So the church is replaced. It's called replacement theology. It is still believed by many, although since 1948, we can clearly see that the prophetic word of God has been fulfilled. So what must happen before the rapture has already happened, and it starts with the the last days. It starts with what would happen in the final, can we say it, generation. So I have some scriptures with you. Let me do a share screen here, and, and we'll talk about these scriptures. So here we go. This is, uh, this is Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 9. It has to do, first of all, with language. And Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 9 says, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. Now, the peoples here in Zephaniah, chapter 3, is the nation's the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Okay, so the nations, the divided peoples of Israel. 
that they all may call on the name of the Lord. And the implication is that they would be together again and they would have the same language again. And uh, also explicitly saying that there was a period of time that was coming in which they would lose their language, but he would restore that language to them so that they could all together, unified, call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. All right. So that's the first, the first prophetic thought of the restoration of the nation of Israel by, first of all, bringing about the language, the Hebrew language. Now, let me interject here and interrupt myself. I know my face just got bigger on the screen. Oh, my goodness. Them coming together as one people and with one language to call on the name of the Lord also has the thought that, as it says in Zechariah, that they will look upon him whom they have pierced and will mourn. They will buy way of this time of Jacob's trouble and the terrible, terrible suffering they will go through like never before in their history, they will turn to Messiah that they crucified and rejected for 2000 years and call upon the name of the Lord. Baruch HaBaba Shem Adonai. They will call upon him. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Jesus will oblige them and will save them. They will call upon him with one language in one accord. And then they're going to serve the Lord. So thank you for the interruption. Being restored, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, they shall again use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities when I bring back their captivity. The Lord bless you, O home of justice and mountain of holiness. Same thing. Now, Jeremiah is prophesying of the return of Israel. Israel did return to a certain extent from the Babylonian captivity, or at least Judah did return. The northern uh, kingdom of Israel had been dispersed by the Assyrians, and so they were scattered to the nations. However, Judah held out longer in, in at least being more faithful to God than the northern kingdom of Israel. And it wasn't, uh, you know, two, almost 200 years later, the Babylonians came because Judah had turned to idols as well. So Babylonians came in and brought about the, um, the, how can I say this? The punishment of Israel for her sins by sending her into captivity, but in the captivity, the remnant of Israel would, would be spared. And that which remained, I should say Judah, not Israel, but that which remained in the land died. Okay. So God spared and protected his people by creating the remnant. And so by the time Jesus comes along 500 years later, almost 500 years later, he's speaking Aramaic. There is some residual Hebrew, but the language of the day was Aramaic. And of course, Greek was coming into prominence as well. And uh, the apostles would be writing in Greek and speaking in Aramaic. And so the Hebrew language effectively for a couple of thousand years has been dead a dead language. But look, the scripture says when he does bring them back to the land, in other words, at the proper captivity, the correct captivity that the scripture is speaking about right here, they would also have the language restored. They shall again use this speech. Okay, so uh, J Jimmy Evans brought this out on one of his short videos. And uh, I found it very fascinating. I knew this, but it, he just reminded me of the impact of this. The, the restoration of the Jewish language took place uh, basically under the tutelage of a guy named Eliezer ben Yehuda, which means uh, Eliezer is also another name for the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, of praise, ben Yehuda, Judah praise amazing uh his lifespan was 19 uh, pardon me 1858 to 1922 he was a russian linguist and he uh brought to, back together all of the elements of the hebrew language and uh put it into a written form again and um although some of the uh 
the pictographs of the Hebrew language changed to a more modern style, uh, he created the first Hebrew newspaper. And so he, the Hebrew language was reintroduced so that by the time the Jews began to flow back into Zion in the late 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, there was a language for them to speak and they adopted it as their own. So Zephaniah chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 31 had to be fulfilled. That was not fulfilled until the last century. All right. Then came the rebirth of the nation of Israel on the land and in the land of Israel. Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 and 8. Look what it says. Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came, she delivered a male child. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. And so that scripture of a nation being born in a day, Zion being born in a day, Israel being reborn in a day without having gone through labor. It's amazing. That labor is going to come later. Uh, it's going to come in the time of Jacob's trouble. That trouble is going to come later. They're birthed. That doesn't mean there wasn't war. Doesn't mean there wasn't difficulty, but it happened overnight when uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion stood up and said, we are declaring ourselves to be the state of Israel. And uh, so the nation was reborn. You come into prophetic fulfillment at that point. And um, let's stop sharing. And Israel is born. And so the fig tree generation came into play, May 14th, 1948. What is the span of that generation? Psalm 90, we know, says 70, 80 years. You know, we're kind of in that flux right now, wondering, is this the generation? And yet we know it's the generation. Some would counter that. Well, you know, you talk about the fig tree, Matthew chapter 24, and it says that it's the fig tree. So it can't be the fig tree because Luke, and Luke chapter 21 says, the fig tree and all the other trees. So it can't be, well, yes, it can, because the other trees are the other nations surrounding Israel that were also prophesied that he was going to bring them back into existence again as well, but this time to bring about their understanding that Jehovah, that Yahweh is God, okay? And so you have the ancient peoples around Israel that were brought back into being before Israel was birthed into being. So within a three or four or five year span, you had Syria, you had Jordan, you had Iraq, you had uh, uh, even Persia transitioning over to becoming Iran, all of the nations, Lebanon, you had these nations come back into existence. They're all the other trees. So all of the prophecy fits, we're in this generation. Not only that, we have myriad prophecies, and especially in Ezekiel chapter 36, which I have talked about over and over again and love to talk about it. And that is that, and I'm not going to read it, but go read Ezekiel 36. The Lord prophesies first to the land, and he says, you get ready because you are about to be more prosperous than you've ever been before because I am bringing my people home. So he calls the land Israel, and then he says, my people Israel. And to boot, he says, they're not coming back as a divided nation. I'm going to take the stick of Ephraim, and I'm going to take the stick of Judah, and I'm going to lash them together, and they're going to be one people. So you put that together with the fact they're one language, and now one people. The ancient has returned. That which was, was prophesied that it would return, and it returned. And the prophecy says, the scriptural progression of prophecy says that that generation that sees that happen would be the last before the day of the Lord actually happened. So what has to happen prophetically before the rapture can take place? Nada. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Only God's timing. Only his timing. Though it tarry, 
it's not going to tarry. Right? Habakkuk chapter 3. Though it seems to tarry, it's not going to tarry. It's going to come at the appointed time. Now, then comes the debate. Okay, is it one of the Moads? I lean to looking at the Moadim, the appointed feasts of the Lord, not the Jews, of the Lord, knowing that we're approaching an appointed feast right now, which would be, uh, which would be the first three feasts, the Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Coming up on that uh, relatively quickly here, right? Uh, Purim is a feast that's being celebrated right now. It's not necessarily the appointed feast. In fact, it's not listed among the seven. Is it important? Yes, because historically it was God preserving the Jews through Esther when the whole world was against them, when Persia was going to uh, Haman, the evil Haman was going to destroy the Jews and God brought about their salvation. Incredible book. It's not one of the appointed feasts. It is not one of the appointed feasts. Some would call it a high watch time. Yeah, could be. Every, I think every day right now is a high watch time. I know, um, I know there's no qualification. There's no qualification when the Lord said, when you see all these things beginning to take place, look up for your redemption draws not. I don't think he's qualifying that by saying, look up more on certain days than other days. No, basically, we're in the time. We are at the time. We are winding down the time before the revelation of the day of the Lord. All right. So nothing, nothing is left to happen. Some would say there's got to be. Now, listen closely. I know there's debate about this. I've studied this for years and years and years. I've kind of come down on one side and that's okay. Some would have come down on another side. That is the debate over second Thessalonians, second Thessalonians chapter two. I'm going to go back to my share screen and we're going to see this again. And uh, here's, here's what it says. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses three and four. I've highlighted one specific set of words that I want to deal with. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day. Remember they had been by forgery. They felt like, okay, the day of the Lord has come. We're in the tribulation. And, and Paul is telling them, look, there's a couple of things that must happen before that day. In other words, before the day of the Lord can come, there has to be two things. First of all, the falling away. We're going to talk about that. And secondly, the man of sin is revealed. The, the rest of it, the coming of the Lord, the return of the Lord to the earth to destroy this, this man of sin will not happen until first the falling away and secondly, the man of sin. So let's read this. No one, let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away, it's the word apostasia, comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple, showing himself that he is God, showing himself that he is God. So he's convinced himself that he's God. All right. We'll talk about the falling away because it, it is the word apostasia. Um. And there are much better studies out there. Here is one of them. I don't know if you can see this. This is done by Andy Wood. Andy, Andy Woods, plural. Okay. Um, the falling away. Is it spiritual departure or physical rapture? He breaks this word down in its use in the New Testament. It's made up of two words, apo, which means apart or away, and histemi, which means to stand. So it is used out of the 16 times that his stemi is used, 14 of them mean a, a spiritual, not a spiritual departure, pardon me, but a physical departure, getting on a boat and departing, departing from Ephesus, departing from here to go there. It's a physical or spatial uh, departure. And yet it is translated in the King James, by the King James Version as being a falling away, implying a falling away from the faith. Now, here's the amazing thing. And why I think, I think this word leans more to the physical departure than it does a falling away. First of all, 
falling away or departing from the faith or apostasy in that thought has taken place since the early church. It's found in the book of Acts of people falling away from the faith. Paul talks about people abandoning him. They have fallen away. He warns Timothy of people falling away and falling away has been normative, sadly, walking away from the faith, turning away from sound doctrine, falling away from sound apostolic doctrine has been happening since the apostles were here, and it was happening while they were here. There were there was falling away. There was apostasia in that thought of how we look at the word apostasia. So apostasia is uh, in this falling away thought or falling away from the faith, turning away from sound doctrine is not an event. It's a normative. It's a normative part of what has been Christianity since the very beginning. Nothing new. It's not an event. And yet, look at the word. There's an article. The article is the uh, article Ho. And that article is, the man of sin is revealed. That is an event. That article, that article amplifies the revelation of the man of sin. So the amplify or the amplification of the man of sin of sin's revelation is an event. There will be an event in which the man of sin rises and is revealed to the world. That event in, uh, as you study the timeline of eschatology, that event, I believe, will be when he steps into the temple and declares himself to be God. When he, when he sets up the, uh, the beast image and this beast, this, this man of sin, this Man of perdition, son of perdition, declares himself to be God, is the revelation. And that's it. That's, that's an event. Now, if you're having a falling away, or that day will not come until there's a lot of falling away, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the text. The same ho is used over here. Ho, apostasia. Ho, it's an event. There is a falling away falling away from the faith, departing from the faith, a spiritual decline turning from sound doctrine to bad doctrine is not an event. It is not an event. It happens over periods of time from wrong teaching, wrong preaching, and deception. It's not an event. So this is an event in the yellow here. So take away the words falling away. It's departure until the departure. I know many are going to disagree with this. That's fine. I'm just, <laughs> I'm convinced. This means the departure, a physical departure. The day of the Lord cannot come until the physical departure, which he has already taught in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the physical departure. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up. That's a departure. We're departing earth, friends. We are departing earth. And so the departure comes first. By the way, and I've said this before too, all the translations uh, of the Bible into English before the 1611 King James Version all translated this as departure, meaning physical departure. It wasn't until the King James translated it as a spiritual departure, spiritual falling away that we get, we came into confusion. I know that's just going to ruffle feathers. You know, sometimes our feathers need to be ruffled so we can see the truth. Apohistemi, apostasy, the two words, apo being apart, histemi being to stand apart, means to depart, to stand off. Okay? So nothing, there's nothing left to happen before the rapture. There's nothing left prophetically before the rapture. I think that's fascinating. I really do. I think that's very fascinating. Not only fascinating, but it gives us a moment to pray. So let's do that. I know some are discouraged. Some are weary of the wait. Honestly, I get that way too from time to time. But we persevere. We press on. I will have a second part to this video, so stay tuned for that second part because I will be dealing with 
what we may see before the rapture and what we are seeing right now. But for now, let's leave it where it is. Heavenly Father, we pray for your strength. Your word says that all we have to do is call upon you and you will strengthen us. And we trust in you and you will lead us and guide us and protect us. And even though we may go through troubles and trials in this earth, uh, we can be of good cheer because you have overcome. And we thank you for that. So strengthen all who are weary and help us to keep our eyes locked on you. And we will say thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So stay tuned for part two. It'll come up within a day or two. And um, we'll see what we're seeing and what we may actually see before the rapture. Blessings to you. Thank you.